Well, I want to say good morning, friends, although had we got this recorded um, the first night, Monday night, I would be saying good evening. Believe it or not, this is take three on Joshua chapters 10 through 11. Pastor Steve um, uh, has taught the class once in Syosset. I did the quiz and he tried again yesterday uh, to record it and it failed. So we are using my phone today, uh, which I don't know whether that's the reason, but it seems to be working. Uh, maybe Pastor C's phone uh, just has issues right now. But anyway, we're excited to be with you uh, to talk about Joshua, uh, chapters 8 and uh, 9, quiz-wise, and then chapters 10 and 11, Pastor Steve will teach immediately after that. So let me start out with the quiz. Um, let's, let's begin. Actually, you know what? We should begin with a word of prayer, because I think that might be a good way to to start off uh, considering that the reason uh, they got into such a mess last time, meaning the people, Joshua and the people, was because they failed to inquire of the Lord first. And none of our cameras have worked up to this point. Maybe it would behoove us to start with uh, prayer. So let's, let's go to God. Father, thank you so much for your word. Thank you for um, uh, what we can learn through the book of Joshua. We thank you for your promises, Lord. And that you're the way, you're the means by which we obtain these promises, Lord. So I pray that you help us to be not only strong and courageous, but diligent and quick to hear your voice, listen it, to it, and obey it, God. We ask all of this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Okay, well, uh, let's begin the quiz. Uh, we'll start with uh, number one. After defeating Ai, God told the Israelites that A, they are to destroy the plunder, B, they may take the plunder. C, only the priests may take the plunder. Or D, there was no plunder. Well, if you chose letter B, you are correct. Uh, you'll recall that this is kind of a reversal. Uh, when it came to Jericho, God had forbidden the people from taking any plunder. Uh, it was uh, banned, essentially. Remember, we, we said harem. Uh, it was set apart, uh, so to speak. And... This time around with Ai, they're all actually allowed to take the plunder. So we don't know why God did that. Uh, maybe he had just loosened up a bit, but maybe it's because he wants to test them to see if they will listen to him carefully and obey him. You know, when he kind of changes course, so to speak. Uh, so this is exactly what they do. They take the plunder. Number two, after choosing his fighting men, Joshua commanded them to A, listen carefully, B, be on the alert, C, march around the city seven times, or D, set an ambush behind the city? Well, the answers are A, B, and D. Uh, you, right from the outset, there's this um, command to listen carefully and to be on the alert. Remember, Joshua and the people are about to uh, attack Ai. Uh, now, this marching around the city seven times, uh, well, that was Jericho on the seventh day, as you'll recall. Um, we, they were told, that is Joshua did tell his men, uh, a group of them, to go uh, outside of the city and set up an ambush. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in just a moment. But A, B, and D are the answers. Number three, Joshua's strategy entailed A, obeying the Lord, B, feigning madness, C, feigning retreat, or D, feigning peace. Now by feigning, I mean pretending, right? Um, the answers are A and C. Uh, they have to obey the Lord. The Lord has given them specific plans, and they've learned their lesson. Remember, they had just been handed a defeat to Ai because they got a little cavalier and thought, well, we can go in and just take them, and they hadn't sought God's uh, input or anything like that. And uh, so this time they're like, no, we're going to follow this to the T. Now, feigning retreat, this is exactly what they did. They pretended to... Um, go out to attack Ai, then turn around and run away, only to lure the people out of the city so that Joshua's men that had been waiting in ambush could sack the place. And, of course, Israel would turn around during that retreat and come back and just defeat all of the people of Ai. Now, what about this feigning madness? Can you think of a passage in the Bible or a situation where uh, someone feigned uh, insanity or madness? Well, if you're thinking of David and 
the Philistines, uh, you're exactly right. Remember, the Philistines thought that people who were a little um, uh, off or maybe they were crazy were interesting. And so if David pretended to be foaming at the mouth and, and to be a little bit crazy, and you know what, they didn't kill him. Uh, they uh, kind of kept him around for entertainment, so to speak. So, uh, it's, but it's not in our case today feigning madness, nor was it feigning peace. They weren't pretending to uh, be coming after them peacefully. Number four, during the battle, Joshua lifted up A, the Lord, B, a curved sword, C, a javelin, or D, a budding rod. Well, if you chose B and C, you're exactly right. Uh, now, we always want to lift up the Lord, but in this context, at this moment, this is not what Joshua was, was doing uh, during the battle. Although you might say in some sense it was, um, in that God's getting the glory because they're obeying him. But actually, B and C are the best answers, and here's why. Remember I said that while the NIV translates this word javelin, which might be right, most scholars today think that what they have in mind is a curved sword, like you might see in Aladdin or something like that. But in any case, uh, Joshua is holding this thing up, this javelin or the sword, and while he's holding it up, um, the battle is being won, and it kind of harkens back to, it's reminiscent of anyway, remember Moses holding up his uh, staff, the rod, and uh, he, his arms grew tired and he had people help hold his arms up so that while this um, instrument's being held up, uh, the battle is being won. It kind of reminds you of that, and this is why I put a budding rod in, I, just to kind of trick you into thinking maybe it's something like Moses, of course, this is a budding rod is not in the text, so it's not correct. But if you got B and C, you're, you're doing very well. Number five, the king of Ai, A, suffered the same fate as the ruler of Jericho. B, was hanged. C, was impaled. D, was covered in a large pile of rocks. Well, if you chose all of them, you're right. Um, we don't know what happened to the king of Jericho because the description isn't given in that battle. But what we do know is after uh, Israel defeats Ai, that it says that their king suffered the same fate as the king of Jericho. Well, what happened to their king? Well, it depends on the translation that you're using, again, the rendering. Most translations say that he was hanged. Uh, that is, hung from a tree or something like that. Uh, but. Uh, the truth is, um, modern scholarship, and I think the NIV gets it right here, seems to say that what's happening is he was impaled on something like a spike or a, a rod, and then uh, kind of hung out there for people to see, oh, this is what can happen, and then they, finally they buried him in a large pile of rocks. Now, you'll recall that these rocks, these piles of rocks, keep piling up in the memory of people. They're piling up because they kind of serve as a reminder that uh, something has occurred. And so the text will say something like, and they're there until this day, meaning contemporaneous with Joshua. So what we're seeing here is a reminder to the nations around, to the people of Israel, uh, what happens uh, when either one defies God or obeys God. And number six. Immediately after entering the land, the Israelites A, built an ark, B, built homes, C, built an altar, or D, dug a well. Well, if you chose letter C, you are correct. It wasn't an ark because you'll remember they already have an ark. Uh, they've been carrying this ark around. And building homes, well, the text doesn't say that. I doubt they immediately went into just started building homes. They are, there was uh, more battle, there were more battles to be fought. And then uh, letter C, well, they did build an altar, the text says, and it says that they built them from unhewn stones. That is to say, stones that hadn't been shaped by iron or any kind of instruments. Now, why would they do that? Well, a couple of reasons. One of them is, is that, well, this is what was commanded to Moses. Um, they were to use unhewn stones. And the other thing is, it might speak to the temporality of the, um, the altar that they're building. They're not trying to shape stones. If you were going to build something like a tabernacle or a uh, temple, you would shape the stones. You'd use instruments to do that to fit them in nicely. Well, this doesn't seem to be the case. This is to be a reminder, but it's not really 
uh, so much an altar that is uh, going to be, say, like a temple or a tabernacle. It's not a reminder, it's a place to commemorate what God has done, uh, but it is, doesn't seem to have the same kind of permanence that, that a temple would. And, well, I don't know about whether they dug a well or not, but the text doesn't say. We do know that wells do get dug in the Bible, but uh, that is not in our text today. Number seven, with Joshua's back against the Mediterranean Sea, blessing was symbolized A, on Joshua's right hand, B, on Mount Gerizim, C, on Mount Ebal, or D, on the ark that they built. Well, A and B are our answers. Now, why? Well, remember, if Joshua's back is to the Mediterranean Sea, this will put his right hand to the south and his left hand to the north. Well, uh, Mount Gerizim would have been south of Mount Ebal. So, remember what Joshua has the people do. He has them act out blessing and cursing. In the Bible, uh, the right hand oftentimes symbolizes a place of uh, blessing, a place of uh, authority and power, and a place of wisdom, whereas the left hand symbolizes the place of foolishness and of curse. And if you re re read Deuteronomy chapter 28, you'll recall all these blessings and curses. Joshua is trying to drive deeply into the hearts of the people the very real promises of blessing or the real threats of curse on each hand. And so he had the people divide, uh, some on his right hand and some on his left hand, to act this out, so to speak. And those that are on his left hand are kind of by uh, Mount Ball. Those on his right hand are kind of by Mount Gerizim. They're on either side. And he's saying, here is an example, a picture, if you will, in reality, of blessing and curse. He wasn't trying to curse one group of people and bless another. He was trying to just drive home this point. So with his back against the Mediterranean Sea, his right hand is the place of blessing, which points to Mount Gerizim. His left hand is a place of curse, which points to Mount Ebal. Number eight, after defeating Ai, the Israelites faced the wrath of A, a plague of serpents, maybe brazen serpents, if you will, B, Jericho, C, a six-city coalition, or D, God. Well, the answer is a six-city coalition. That plague of serpents, uh, brazen serpents, fiery serpents, that's a different story altogether in the Bible. That doesn't show up here. Jericho's already been defeated. Uh, we saw that in the prior week, and uh, God uh, is not pouring out his wrath at this point on um, his people. So it seems like letter C is the only viable choice, and it's exactly right. You'll remember all those it's, the Hittites, the Hivites, you know, the Jebusites, the Amorites, so on and so forth. Well, they had seen what had happened to both Jericho and Ai, and they put their heads together and said, we need to do something. We are going to have to work together because it seems as though these Israelites are wiping out everybody. They're conquering everybody. So they formed a six-city or nation, if you want to. That's probably too strong of a term. Coalition uh, to come out and to fight the Israelites. Well, another name for the Gibeonites, who is one of those ites, uh, in uh, the six city coalition is what? Is it A, the Hivites, B, the, or I mean, A, the Hittites, B, the Hivites, C, the Benjaminites, or D, the Nephilim? Well, the answer is Hivites. Those terms are used interchangeably. It's not the Hittites. The Benjaminites, um, well, not even in the picture. These are uh, part of uh, the tribe of Israel, so to speak, and D, the Nephilim, well, these are just those giants that were formed uh, as a consequence of uh, the cohabitation between the B'nai Elohim, those, we'll call them fallen angels, if you will, and uh, human women. Or if you take a different stance, maybe the line of Seth. Uh, number 10, the Gibeonites. A, broke the Sixth City Coalition. B, feigned being from a distant country. C, became workers for the house of Joshua's God. D, became known as Benjamites. Well, the answers are A through C. They were part of that original Sixth City Coalition, but apparently they didn't think this coalition was such a good idea. In fact, they had heard about Joshua's God, Israel's God, and what he had done, how he brought them through the Red Sea, how he had uh, given them victory over Jericho. And so he is, uh, uh, and, and over Ai. 
So this, this group, the Gibeonites, are like, hey, we need to do something about this. So they feigned, they pretended to be from a distant country. Now, why would they do that? Well, it's because, as you'll recall, Israel is forbidden from entering a covenant or t- uh, going into an oath with uh, nations inside of Canaan. But they could do that with nations outside of Canaan. And so the Gibeonites, even though they're from within Canaan, they, they pretended to be from without Canaan. And they did this because they thought, we can get them to make an oath with us and maybe uh, avoid annihilation. Uh, but while they managed to trick Joshua and the leaders of Israel, and remember they did it by putting on uh, worn out clothes, they had moldy bread, they just looked very disheveled and, and um, um, devolved, if you will. And uh, Joshua fell for it, the elders fell for it, and they, they made an oath uh, with them. And now Joshua says, well, later, you know, you may have fooled us into making this oath by uh, pretending to be from a far country, but here's what's going to happen to you. You're going to end up being workers in the house of our God. That is to say, they became wor- woodworkers, and they'd serve in Joshua's uh, uh, God's house. The Benjaminites I just threw in there because I put it in the previous one and I wanted to try to fool you. Or, well, not really. I just wanted you to be a little more discriminating. Uh, Number 11, Israel's leaders made an oath with uh, the Gibeonites because, A, it gave them a military advantage. B, it seemed right in the sight of God. C, the Gibeonites were circumcised. Or D, they failed to inquire of the Lord first. Well, the answer is D, they failed to inquire of the Lord first. This was a big deal. This is a big deal. The point of the text is to say, you know what? You should have sought the Lord first. We said that prayer should be a first resource, not a last resort. This is a very big deal. Had they inquired of the Lord first, they had never entered into an oath with the Gibeonites, which ends up proving to be a thorn in their flesh later, uh, this oath, that is. And it, it gave them no military advantage uh, to, to do this. And it didn't seem right in the sight of God. They didn't even inquire of God. And the Gibeonites were not circumcised. They just pretended to be from outside of Canaan. And finally, we come to number 12. Based on the Israelites' leaders' comments and actions, one might infer, A, an oath is binding. B, the people wanted to kill the Gibeonites. C, failure to seek the Lord first is a cause for mourning. Or D, Gibeonites make good allies. Well, it's A through C. Oaths are binding. These are different than just regular covenants. This oath would uh, be sworn in the name of Yahweh, and you just don't break it lest something disastrous come on you. Uh, We know that the people wanted to kill the Gibeonites. We can infer it anyway because the leaders say, let the people live, which kind of implies that, hey, Uh, These leaders are probably, or not leaders, but the people are ticked off. Why would you enter into an oath with these Gibeonites? You're supposed to be our leaders. What have you done? So Joshua and the elders had to talk them out of maybe stoning them or killing them. Uh, Failure to seek the Lord first is a cause for mourning. Well, we get this from the text because they're pouring ashes on themselves. That is the elders. You know, the leaders are very upset. They're very disappointed uh, that they've done... uh, uh, They've, they've done this thing. They've committed themselves to an oath, and uh, now they're bound. And do Gibeonites make, well, good allies? Well, Pastor Steve's going to answer that in just a moment. They end up being um, detrimental in any way. They get you into a mess because you, you, have to, well, you have to keep the oath. So hopefully you all did very well on that. This has been the third time we've recorded it, third time's a charm. You missed out the best quiz. I did it best last time. But, uh, and hopefully, Pastor Steve, this third time's the charm, best teaching as he comes. Let's, uh, let's give it over to him now. All right, hello everyone, and uh, yes, as Pastor Nathan said, we are doing it again, and so um, I'm very uh, glad, hopefully, this will be the one. I'm actually watching myself on 
the computer, a different computer, that it's actually going through to Facebook. So I am uh, hopeful. Well, we have a great passage tonight. I know I say that almost every single week, but uh, we do have a great passage, and it relates specifically to one of the most dramatic scenes, arguably, in the Bible. Pastor Steve, that's a pretty big claim you're making. I think you'll see why uh, when we get to it. Um, but this is a, an amazing passage. And so let's dive in. We're looking at Joshua chapter 10. Joshua chapter 10. And I'm going to read the first part of this chapter. And then we're going to talk about it. Have your Bible open or it will not be on the screen. Now Adonai Zedek, king of Jerusalem, heard that Joshua had taken... I'm going to pronounce it a little different than Pastor Nathan. I always learned it as Ai and totally destroyed it, doing to Ai and its king as he had done to Jericho and its king, and that the people of Gibeon had made a treaty of peace with Israel and had become their allies. He and his people were very much alarmed at this because Gibeon was an important city, like one of the royal cities. It was larger than Ai, and all its men were good fighters. So Adonai Zedek, king of Jerusalem, appealed to Hoham, king of Hebron, Piram, king of Jarmuth, Japhia, king of Lachish, Deber, king of Eglon, come up and help me attack Gibeon, he said, because it has made a peace with Joshua and the Israelites. Then the five kings of the Amorites, the kings of Jerusalem, Hebron, Jarmuth, Lachish, Eglon, joined forces. They moved up with their troops and took positions against Gibeon and attacked it. So we have the, the setting of a major battle here. We go on. The Gibeonites sent word to Joshua in the camp of Gilgal. Do not abandon your servants. Come up to us quickly. Save us. Help us. Because the Amorite kings from the hill country have joined forces against us. So Joshua marched up from Gilgal and with his entire army, including all the best fighting men, the Lord said to Joshua, do not be afraid of them. I have given them into your hand. Not one of them will be able to withstand you. After an all night march from Gilgal, Joshua took them by surprise. The Lord threw them into confusion before Israel. So Joshua and the Israelites defeated them completely at Gibeon. Israel pursued them along the road up to Beth Horon and they cut them down all the way to Azekah and Makeda. As they fled before the Israel on the road down from Beth Horon to Azekah, the Lord hurled large hailstones down on them and more of them died from the hail than were killed by the swords of the Israelites. On the day the Lord gave the Amorites over to Israel, Joshua said the Lord to the Lord in the presence of Israel. Now get this. Sun, stand still over Gibeon and you moon over the valley of Aj Ajalon. So the sun stood still and the moon stopped till the nation avenged itself on its enemies, as it is written in the book of Jashar. The sun stopped in the middle of the sky and delayed going down about a full day. There has never been a day like it before or since, a day when the Lord listened to a human being. Surely the Lord was fighting for Israel. Then Joshua returned with all Israel to the camp at Gilgal. Okay, as you can see, a pretty amazing passage. If I was to summarize this passage we're going to do tonight, which is chapter 10 and chapter 11, I would say that these phrases bear in mind. The land is yours, walk across. The land is yours, walk across. What we notice is that there is no casualties mentioned of the Israelites' troops. None. There is no listing of how they have died in battle, which may not be the case. It may be the case, but I can tell you the text doesn't say that anyone died. The sense is that the Lord is doing the fighting for them and that that is the miracle. The next thing is that very phrase, the Lord fights your battles. These principles, the land is yours, walk across, the Lord fights your battles, I think can transcend time. And so we all have battles in life. We all have challenges. 
there is a high optimism that you and I can learn something from this passage as we press on and look what's going on. So let's dig right in, chapter 10, verse 1. Adonai Zedek, king of Jerusalem. Pause right here. This is the first mention of the city of Jerusalem in our Bibles. Now, some of you, people who know your Bible, you may say, hold on, Pastor Steve, hold on. Doesn't Melchizedek, who meets with Abraham, come from Jerusalem? And I would say he absolutely does. But what was the city called back then? Salem. He was the king of Salem. Now, you can see the connection, Jerusalem or Salem. But in this particular case, this is the first mention of the city of Jerusalem in our scriptures. Now, with that being said, I also want to point out that from this point on, Jerusalem is so central to the story, the narrative of Israel. And even the work of redemption for our Lord was crucified and rose uh, to new life in Jerusalem. But as I am talking, there is great division taking place in the Middle East. There are missiles being lobbed over from Gaza into Israel. There are missiles being lobbed from Israel into Gaza. Buildings coming down, people dying. It's a tragic situation. And I think it's appropriate, as the psalmist asks us, to pray for the peace of Jerusalem. Now, before we go any further, let's do that right now. Father, we recognize that as we hear the first mention of Jerusalem, in the context of a battle, Lord, I pray that you would bring your peace to Jerusalem. Father, we know that the Jewish people are precious to you, and we recognize that. But we also know, Father, that in the end, we ask that you would be glorified in all we say and do as we seek to honor your words of praying for the peace of Jerusalem. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay, so let's go back into our text. And I want to point out that a theme that has showed up in the book of Joshua is that there is a fear that is spread across the land relating to Joshua. After what they heard uh, took place during the uh, movement from Egypt, that word spread that all these peoples fell before them. And then most recently, the collapse of Jericho before their very eyes causes a fear across the land. I want to review some of these passages so you could see that as to what is going on, why this king Adonai Zedek is so upset. Here's Joshua chapter 2. We have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea for you when you came out of Egypt, and what he did to Sihon and Og, the two kings and the Amorites, east of the Jordan, whom you completely destroyed when you heard of it. Our hearts melted in fear, and everyone's courage failed because of you. For the Lord your God is God in heaven above and on earth below. Anyone remember who said those words? Pause for a moment. Very famous person in scripture. It was Rahab the innkeeper or Rahab the prostitute, depending on how you translate that. Yes, she was talking about how fear had swept the city of Jericho. Here's another statement that comes from Joshua 5. We read this. Now when all the Amorite kings west of the Jordan and all the Canaanite kings, that actually includes our bunch here, along the coast, heard how the Lord had dried up the Jordan before the Israelites until they had crossed over. Their hearts melted in fear and they no longer had the courage to face the Israelites. Again, fear sweeping the land. Here's one more. This comes from the Gibeonites. Verse, uh, chapter 9, verse 24, they answered Joshua, Your servants were clearly told how the Lord your God had commanded his servants Moses to give, them, uh, give you the whole land and wipe out its inhabitants from before you. So we feared for our lives because of you, and that is why we did this. And so they're explaining why they did this ruse before Joshua, pretending that they were a faraway nation. They were scared to death. So, in light of that, this particular king from Jerusalem is anxious, is fearful, and is indeed worried as to what is going to be happening. Uh, Pastor Nathan, you're coming in. Is anything going wrong? No, but I don't want anything to go wrong because of there's an alarm on my phone. <laughs> so, just... 
keep continue. Uh, okay, uh, Pastor Nathan popped in as I'm recording because of an alarm that's on his clock and he's being sensitive and concerning for me. I appreciate that. Thank you, Pastor Nathan. So let's go to the, the map actually here and see what is taking place. If you look at the map, here is Gilgal. This is where Joshua and his troops are. Uh, one of the nice things of the way we're recording here is I can reach out and actually point to this uh, map. And here is Gibeon, and this is where the battle will take place. Now, the cities that are coming against Joshua are these cities. So you see Jerusalem, Jermon, Lachish, Eglon, and Hebron. And these cities are all going to be converging here at Gibeon. Now, one of the things the text says, which is interesting and needs a little explanation, verse 2, um, it says here, he and all his people were very much alarmed at this because Gibeon was an important city. Now, why was it important? Because this city provided access to the north. It's a trade route, actually called the King's Highway. And this is a big deal. And you may say, well, why not go around it? Why not go that way? Why not go this way? We're in the mountains. You just don't go through the mountains. You have to go through dry riverbeds called wadis. And those wadi systems or dry riverbeds are the primary means of transportation because most of the time there is no water in them at all. They're just great lowland transportation as you're weaving your way through the mountains. So it's an important city for that. But it's not only for that reason. It says here in the text, like one of the royal cities it was larger than Ai. Now what we mean by that is Gibeon was not just a city in which people lived within the, the confined walls, but it is a community, farms, fields, where people are raising their crops. It is the leading city in that area. So the fall of Gibeon, or I should say the treaty made with Joshua by the Gibeonites is producing great fear. It's an important city. This is gonna possibly block their trade routes, possibly just the symbolic nature of a major city falling, a very, very difficult thing to stomach. So with that in mind, um, the Gibeonites say, please, Joshua, help us. And as Pastor Nathan just said during the quiz, this agreement that the Gibeonites made with Joshua tell us a little bit of the character of Joshua. Because truth be told, if this ruse never take, took place, Josh would be like, good, knock yourselves out. We're taking the whole land anyway. But now here it is, Joshua needs to come to the rescue of the people that he just made a treaty for, which again shows the character of Joshua. I'm always fascinated when I see descriptions of character. And what I mean by this is a leader will often come to light as to whether or not this is a good man or a bad man. And what would be a good man defined as? A good man would be defined as somebody who is willing to honor his word, to stick with it. Uh, there is a story that I uh, love and remember. It relates to a former president. Now, I know lots of people have lots of opinions on presidents, good and bad. It's kind of where we have a, a lightning rod issue in our culture. But for my own journey, one president who showed his character was Ronald Reagan in an area that I would say most people thought it was a bad decision on his part. But I was actually impressed with this decision. What happened was Germany, Helmut Kohl, had asked Reagan if when he came to Germany, he'd be willing to lay a wreath in a cemetery called Bitburg. So the soldiers who died in World War II, even though they were enemies of the United States, they were just average grunts, you know, doing their country's bidding and, and fighting in a war. Would you put a wreath on their uh, graves when you come? Uh, Cole was up for re-election and it meant a lot to him in their friendship. And Reagan said, I would be happy to do that. Well, it was soon discovered and revealed that along with these regular average German soldiers, there was also some SS troops buried there. Now, these are the notorious SS troops participating in concentration camps, extermination of the Jewish population. And there was a general feeling that 
if these people are buried in the same cemetery, you should not go, President Reagan. And so Congress actually took a vote. I believe it was purely in the Senate, but the vote was almost 100%. Mr. President, don't go. And then they took polls around the country and the, the overwhelming view of the people in the United States was, Mr. President, don't go. But he felt, I made a promise to this man and I'm not gonna back down on my promise. And so what they did is they downplayed the visit. They went, there was no speeches, they laid a wreath, they came out. But when all was said and done, when I saw that somebody honored a promise over and above all this public opinion saying, don't do it, I thought that is a measure of somebody's character that I'm willing to honor my promise even at great cost to me. And that's what I see Joshua is doing. He's honoring a promise, even at great cost to himself. So we move on in the passage, and uh, these kings are all invited to help the king of Jerusalem fight the five kings. Verse 5 of the Amorites, king of Jerusalem, Hebron, Jarmuth, Lachish, Eglon, joined forces. They moved up with all their troops and set up positions against Gibeon and attacked it. So these nations are now attacking right here. And Gibeon cries out, send word to Joshua at Gilgal, do not abandon your servants, come up to us quickly, save us, help us. Because the Amorite kings from the hill country have joined forces against us. And so, as a result, Joshua March, verse seven, from Gilgal, with his entire army, including the best fighting men. Now the Lord has a word for him on this journey. The Lord said to Joshua, verse eight, do not be afraid of them. I have given them into your hand. Not one of them will be able to withstand you. What a great promise. What a great promise. Do you hold to the promises of God in your own life? Do you know what the promises of God are? That would imply that you're actually reading the Bible. The reason I'm saying this is because Joshua is given courage from the Lord and the word of the Lord. He's given this word before. Remember Joshua 1, be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid. It's being repeated here. Five armies are coming against you. Joshua, do not be afraid. You know, in my own journey as a pastor, I have come to value the promises of God so highly. You know, in the book of Joshua, there are times where they put a big pile of rocks together and they use this phrase, that there'll be one tonight and the rocks are there to this day. You know, I have so many piles of rocks in my life where I saw where God did something amazing. When I think of God keeping his promises, I cannot help but think of a story. And for those of you who've watched me teach before, heard me teach, you've heard the story. I repeat it a lot, it's one of my monuments. But it's a story of uh, the Lord telling me when I became pastor of Shelter Rock Church, Steve, hold your people loosely and you'll never lack for people. And hold your money loosely, the church's money, and you'll never lack for money. Now, what did that mean? As I understood what the Lord was saying to me, what he impressed in my heart is that if a church planter comes and he wants to start a church, be favorable. Offer an opportunity of that church planter to gather people from your church to help start that church. That church planter needs people who are going to be tithing, giving, working, serving. Be willing to give those people. And very early on, a church wanted to get started in Huntington. The pastor attended this church uh, very early on in my tenure, and then he wants to start his church and he wants to start with people from this congregation. We gave our blessing. I remember we had a free will offering for this guy. $20,000 came in to give to him and help him in his church. God provided our resources from the money that we gave to him. And that church was founded with people from this church. Fast forward in time, that church grew to about 200 people. But then due to circumstances, about 10 years ago, the pastor felt that the church could not press on, even though it had 200 people because they lost their location where they were meeting and the pastor was at kind of a low ebb in his life. Well, you know what happened with those people? 
that pastor invited him to come back to us. God took care of us all through the process. We didn't lose any finances and the people that we invested, we took in probably double back what we gave to that church plant. God does that. Here's another church, good friend my entire tenure here, Brian McMillan, a pastor of Centerpoint Church, now the largest evangelical church in Long Island. But when they were a church of 600 people, they're packed into a, a smaller auditorium and they're looking at a Jewish synagogue to purchase. But they're a poor church because they're young people. They're 28 years old on average. And what are they gonna do? How are they gonna get money for about $1.7 million purchase? And so Pastor Brian cast the vision to me. And I said, Brian, let's have you preach at our two campuses. At the time we had two campuses. He preaches in Syosset and Manhasset. And get this, we raised almost $45,000 for him. $45,000. I'll be honest, when I heard how much we raised, I was afraid that we took in no money for our own church. At that time, we needed $40,000 a week to make budget. And so what happened? I went down downstairs to our treasurer, Martha Parkinson, and I said, Martha, uh, how did the offering go on Sunday? And she said, oh, Pastor Steve, we took in a lot of money for that young man. And uh, he, he did very well. And she told me the number. And I said, yes, Martha, I know how much we took in for him. But how much did we take in for us? And she said, oh, the Lord bless. We took in $55,000 for us. For us? We had a $100,000 weekend? And the Lord said, Steve, I told you. When you became pastor, hold your people loosely. You won't lack for people. Hold the church's money loosely. You won't lack for money. During the pandemic, we discovered the same thing. Uh, pastor Henry, you might remember, uh, pointed out to the church a year ago that our giving was down because of the pandemic. We were normally taking around 60,000 a week. We were now taking in 35,000. He lets the congregation know about the seriousness of the situation. And what happens? The following week, we take in close to about 130,000. The following week, we take in uh, 80 or 90,000. The following week, we take in about 70,000. God was good. Coming out of the pandemic, right now, as we're starting to release the requirements, we have almost twice, amount, twice the amount of money in the bank than we did in the beginning of the pandemic. That is God's generosity. You know what we did all through this pandemic? is give stuff away. Give stuff to church plants, give stuff to humanitarian. We helped uh, Hempstead schools put laptop computers in the hands of the, each of their students. We had almost 600 families a week coming to our food pantry during the summer. The BBC was flying a helicopter over our food pantry to film what was taking place. And as we kept giving stuff away, the Lord kept providing more and more and more stuff to us. We came through this pandemic with more money in our community outreach fund than we ever had before. We came through the pandemic with more money in our benevolence fund than we ever had before. All because I believe God keeps honoring his promises. You be generous with the church's money, I'll be generous with you. Lord, thank you. I just have to say thank you and in the same sense, honor the promises of God, believe them. So what happens with this battle? After an all-night march from Gilgal, now that is a march from here to here, it's about 15 miles, mountainous marching. Um, they, they, you would think they were exhausted, 15 miles. Just think how long that takes for you to go with an army, 15 miles. They go all night long. And it says here, Joshua took them by surprise. Verse 10, the Lord threw them into confusion before Israel, so Joshua and the Israelites defeated them completely. Israel pursued them along the road up to Beth Horon. That's Beth Horon. Now you're seeing these cities are south, and you're like, why are they heading to Beth Horon? Because they're following the dry uh, wadi system, the, the, the dry riverbeds. And so that is what they do. The Lord cut them down, and they went all the way from Azekah. And here's where they're going, Azekah and Maqueda. That's where they're heading. And as they're heading, fascinating little passage, 
Now I'm gonna flip some slides over so you can see this because this is an artist's rendition of what happened. But the Lord rained down hail on them. Now the Hebrew actually is stones. The interpretation is probably good size hail things, but could be stones and large hailstones down on them and more died from the hail than were killed by the swords of the Israelites. That is amazing. Remember I said the lesson of this passage, walk through the land. God's given it to you. God is going to fight your battles. And so I'm going to go back to our other passage here. And we have, uh, this is a, another map of what is taking place. Here is Jericho. There's Gilgal. That's where they were. This is a relief map, so you see some of the mountains. Then the battle is taking place there at Gibeon, and then ensuing, chasing them down to their uh, other cities. And so uh, looking at that map and, and going back to our uh, text, verse 12. On the day the Lord gave the Amorites over to Israel, Joshua said to the Lord in the presence of Israel. Now, check out this prayer and see if any of your prayers are outrageous like this one. Look at this. On the day the Lord gave the Amorites over to Israel, Joshua said to the Lord in the presence of Israel, Sun, stand still over Gibeon, and you moon over the valley of Ajalon. So the sun stood still, and the moon stopped, till the nation avenged itself on its enemies, as it is written in the book of Jashar. The sun stopped in the middle of the sky and delayed going down about a full day. There has never been a day like it before or since, a day when the Lord listened to a human being. Surely the Lord was fighting for Israel. There's your key phrase for this whole section. The Lord was fighting for Israel. So let's get back to this. Was that crazy or what? Now, pause for a moment. I have prayed some outrageous things. I have. I prayed them in my prayer closet. I prayed them in my office. I didn't pray them in front of large masses of people. But this statement, sun stand still, clearly is a man of incredible faith. And why did he want this sun to stand still? Because if you notice, even on this map, the distance of here to here, 15 miles, all night journey, to chase all these peoples about 30, 35 to 40 miles, is going to take time, more than there will be daylight. And so Joshua asked this outrageous request. Lord, would you make the sun stand still? Now pause for a moment. Joshua is using the language of accommodation. I don't know what his thoughts were in terms of whether the, the earth revolves around the sun or the sun around the earth. I can't speak for that, but I can tell you this. He is using the language of accommodation for what he sees, just like you and I do. So I said today, the sun rose. The sun literally didn't rose, the earth turned at its axis. But we don't talk that way, do we? Even though intellectually we know of a solar system, we also speak in terms of what we observe, where the sun is in the sky. This passage is not trying to make a statement about astronomy. What it is trying to make a statement about the power of God and the faith of Joshua and the ability of God to do anything he chooses, anything he chooses. And the author here points out, has there ever been a day where God listened to man on such a level like this? Absolutely amazing. <clears throat> By the way, if you want to look at a passage that actually does imply that the Bible knows that the earth revolves around the sun is a passage in Isaiah 40 where it says this, the Lord sits enthroned above the circle of the earth. The Lord sits enthroned above the circle of the earth. And so there, there are passages which give that sense of the earth being a globe. 
But once again, it is not the focus of the Bible. Generally speaking, the Bible uses a language of accommodation that people who are reading it will understand what is going on. Now, has God ever done anything like that before this or done anything like that after this? And there is an interesting passage and it comes from the book of 2 Kings chapter 20. Hezekiah has just been told, King Hezekiah, that his days are numbered. The Lord says, Hezekiah, get your affairs in order. You're going to die. And Hezekiah says, no, Lord, please, 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 let me live, let me live, let me live. And so what's going to happen? How are they going to handle that? Well, the Lord grants mercy and says to him, well, Hezekiah, I am going to let you live. But Hezekiah wants proof, a sign from the Lord that he's going to be granted extra life. And here's what we read. Hezekiah asked the prophet Isaiah, what will be the sign that the Lord will heal me and that I will go up to the temple of the Lord on the third day from now? Isaiah responded, this is the Lord's sign to you that the Lord will do what he has promised. Shall the shadow go forward 10 steps or shall it go back 10 steps? So he's asking a question. Here's what Hezekiah says. It's a simple matter for the shadow, for the shadow to go forward 10 steps, said Hezekiah. Rather, have it go back 10 steps. So if you could picture a sundial, of course it's easy for the sun just to move along in its normal course and change the shadow. So Hezekiah says, you know, it would be really impressive if you bring it from like one o'clock in the afternoon to 10 o'clock in the morning. That would be impressive. And so, verse 11, then the prophet Isaiah called out to the Lord and the Lord made the shadow go back 10 steps as it had gone down on the stairway of Ahaz. That is pretty amazing. So it's not the first, it's not the only time that the Lord changed astronomical events and nor is it going to be the last time as we see in the book of Revelation as there are going to be signs in the heavens of what God is going to be doing. Um, but it is an example of the power of the Lord and I think most importantly the faith of Joshua and why the people are gaining more and more faith in following this commander. So there's a phrase here that I want to point out. Verse 13. So the sun stood still, the moon stopped, till the nation avenged itself of its enemies, as it is written in the book of Jashar. Quick question, what testament is the book of Jashar? Well, I don't think it's in the New Testament. It must be in the Old Testament. Now, if you're smart, it's not in any of the Bible. In fact, we don't even have a copy of this book. We have a couple snippets of this book. This is one of them. Another one shows up in 2 Samuel. Now, this is after David has witnessed the death of Saul and Jonathan, his close friend. And we read this in 2 Samuel chapter 1. David took up this lament concerning Saul and his son Jonathan. He ordered that the people of Judah be taught this lament of the bow. It is written in the book of Jashar. Now, here's a little snippet of it. A gazelle lies slain on your heights, Israel, how the mighty have fallen. And it goes on from there. What is the book of Jashar? It apparently is a book that contains epic poems, accounts of great Israelite battles, victories, defeats. But it is a time and opportunity for an oral culture to remember them, to quote them, to tell the stories to their children. And that is what the book of Jashar seems to have been. I wish we had a copy of it. It would be amazing. We do not. So what the Lord wanted to preserve for us are these two snippets. The sun stood still. I can certainly see how that ended up in the book of Jashar. And the sad story of the death of Saul and Jonathan. And so this is a depiction of what happened in the battle. But now what we are going to see is a story of what is taking place as we unfold this battle in kind of like more details. So verse 16. Now the five kings had fled and hidden in a cave at uh, Maqueda. In fact, let's go back to our map here so you can see it. 
So they hid in a cave down here. So Gilgal is where Joshua started, went to Gibeon, fought the battle, then came down, ended up in Makeda. So that's where the kings end up in a cave. When Joshua was told that the five kings had been found hiding in the cave Makeda, it's kind of like Saddam Hussein, um, he said, roll large rocks up the mouth of the cave and post some men there to guard it. Hey, we don't need to worry about these guys. They have put themselves in a cave, lock the door, just keep them there until we get it to them later because we have more important things to do. We need to finish this battle. But don't stop, pursue your enemies, attack them from the rear and don't let them reach the cities for the Lord your God has given them into your hand. So Joshua and the Israelites defeated them completely. But a few survivors managed to reach their fortified cities. The whole army then returned safely to Joshua at the camp of Makeda, and no one uttered a word against the Israelites. Now, I would say that would be prudent, <laughs> since they have just won the day. Joshua said, open the mouth of the cave and bring those five kings out to me. So that they brought out the five kings out of the cave, the kings of Jerusalem, Hebron, Jarmuth, Lachish, Eglon. And they had them brought these kings to Joshua he summoned all the men of Israel and said to the army commanders who had come with them, come here and put your feet on the necks of these kings. So they came forward and placed their feet on their necks. Joshua said to them, do not be afraid or discouraged. Well, after this, <laughs> sun stands still, moon stands still. I don't know how they could be afraid or discouraged, but the gruesome scene here of putting your foot on their necks is showing absolute power, absolute authority. And he's having these five commanders exercise this absolute power and authority, probably to build their confidence and strength. Moving forward, this is what the Lord will do to all your enemies you're going to fight. Object lesson, guys. As your feet are on the necks of these kings, God is gonna make the straight, the path, anywhere we go. You know, one of the things that uh, Pastor Henry and I share is as he has now taken the baton and he's running hard with it, we talk a lot. And one of the things that Pastor Henry has to deal with from me is lots of my stories. I'm gonna tell him my stories because I want his foot to be proverbially on the neck of the enemies, the challenges that he's going to be facing, because I want him to be confident with what God is going to do under his tenure, because I witness God do amazing things, and I believe he's going to do amazing things under Pastor Henry's tenure too, but we need to tell these stories, and this is that object lesson. Then Joshua put the kings to death, exposed their bodies on five poles, and they were left hanging on the poles until evening. At sunset, Joshua gave the order and took them down from the poles and threw them into a cave where they had been hiding. At the mouth of this cave, they placed large rocks, which are there till this day. That phrase comes up over and over. What's going to happen? Years from now, a father's going to be walking with a son or daughter and say, Dad, why are these rocks here? And you know what daddy's going to say? Son, there's a story behind those rocks. Behind those rocks are five kings buried. Let me tell you the story about the day the sun stood still. Wow. Do you have lots of piles of rocks in your family history? I hope you do. And if you don't, pray that God gives you some amazing stories. My poor children hear daddy tell the stories over and over. We drive by Wall Whitman High School in Huntington. And I say, see the high school there? All at once, the kids in my car start rolling their eyes. Here comes the story again. And it's going to be one of these several stories about how God did this or how God did that. But you know what? Passing Wall Women High School for me is a pile of rocks. There are so many times where passing by this or going to this place reminds me of something dramatic God did in my life. You and I both should have piles of stones where we remember the work of God. You know, one of the things that I absolutely love doing is I look up stories on the internet 
so I can see artist depictions. Remember I showed you this one? This is the artist depiction of stones coming down. I find that funny. You know, it, it's just interesting looking at how somebody might draw this. But there are others. This is an artist depiction of the five commanders putting their feet on the neck of soldiers. Now, in this picture, I don't know how well you can see it online, but these are the five soldiers, and these are the kings whom they have their foot on their neck. This was found in a Byzantine chapel. This dates probably 1,500 years ago. Old, old chapel. Byzantine chapel basically means the origins of the Orthodox Church. We're talking Turkey, we're talking Middle East. I'm not sure where this particular Byzantine chapel was found. But why would you put this in a church? You see, if, if you came to Shelter Rock, and we have some art hanging in our church, particularly Syosset, but it's like uplifting art, kind of fun art. But would you be surprised if you saw this? Here are five kings with somebody putting their foot on their neck right before they're killed. I realize we live in a different generation and a different time, but when you are a persecuted people and the church of Jesus Christ has been persecuted so many times over the years, as it is right now, for example, in the, the nation of uh, Nigeria, where Boko Haram is, is acting and doing tremendous atrocities against Christians. But you look at something like this and you know what their generation would look we're gonna win we will win God will bring a dramatic and glorious conclusion to this we might not hang something like this on our church walls but you should know the stories and you should know that our God will win no matter what we're seeing no matter what we're experiencing I, I look often at people who are so anxious over the results of, let's say, the presidential election or, or a decision that Congress is making or a governor is making. And they're like, oh my, oh my, what are we going to do as Christians, this, that, or the other thing. And flip the parties, do whatever you want. But the bottom line is, you're looking too low. Look up. In the end, our God wins. And we belong to a different kingdom. So take joy, take comfort, and I understand why these Byzantines hung this. But I saw some other fun things on the internet. You know there's a Bible that has all biblical depictions with Lego characters. So here's a fun one. Here is five Lego commanders with their foot on the neck of the five kings. Pretty gross. And then you see the five kings hanging from trees, and even worse, their heads on the ground below them like their cattle with the blood draining from their bodies. My goodness, and this is a children's Bible? I just find it so funny when you look at the internet and you find these things. I picture some sadistic person, somebody somewhere putting these uh, Lego figures together. Um, I get a kick at it though every time I, I see it. And here's one more. This is actually a piece of art of history and you see the five kings hanging. Why is this depicted so many times in art? Once again, remember, our God wins, our God reigns. So now let's finish this chapter. And let me give you a, a little briefing before I read the next section here. It's kind of gruesome, it's kind of gruesome. That day, Joshua took Makeda. He put the city and its king to the sword and totally destroyed everyone in it. He left no survivors. And he did to Makeda what he had done to the kings of Jericho. Then Joshua and all Israel with him moved on from Makeda to Libna and attacked it. The Lord gave that city and its king into Israel's hand. The city and everyone in it Joshua put to the sword. He left no survivors there. He did to its king as he had done to the kings of Jericho. Then Joshua and all of Israel with him moved on from Libna to Lachish. He took the positions against it, attacked it, and the Lord gave Lachish into the hands of Israel's hands, and Joshua took it on the second day. The city and everyone in it he put to the sword, just as he had done to Libna. 
Meanwhile, the king Horam of Gezer had come up to help Lachish, but Joshua defeated him and his army until no survivors were left. Then Joshua and all of Israel moved up from Lachish to Eglon. Now this is going to repeat. I'm not gonna read all of it just to save a little bit of time, but I wanna move now to the end of that section. Look with me at verse 40. So Joshua had subdued the whole region, including the hill country, the Negev, the western foothills, the mountain slopes, together with all their kings. He left no survivors. He totally destroyed all who breathed, just as the Lord, the God of Israel, had commanded. Joshua subdued them from Kadesh Barnea to Gaza, from the whole region of Goshen to Gibeon. All these kings, their lands, Joshua conquered in one campaign because the Lord, the God of Israel, fought for Israel. Then Joshua returned with all Israel to the camp at Gilgal. Now we need to pause for a moment and talk about this because this whole section that I just read, I even skimmed because it's difficult to read. It's, and they killed them all and everyone who breathed, and they slaughtered everyone. You know, when we have an alpha class, we usually have a weekend away in which you can ask the pastors anything. It's a, we call it the Holy Spirit weekend. It's an opportunity for people to invite the Holy Spirit to be empowered in their life. But one of the things we do is we recognize that there's a lot of questions that people have. So Pastor Nathan or myself or Pastor Jerry, we sit up front and anyone can ask any question they want to deal with difficult questions in the Bible. And inevitably, the question comes up, Pastor Steve, Pastor Nathan, Pastor Jerry, why all this death? Now, pausing for a moment, if we were back in time and we are telling this story as Israelites, we'd be opening champagne bottles because God has given us the land, he's subdued our enemies, and we are thrilled, but fast forward 3,000 years, <laughs> we look at this and we say, wasn't there a better way to fight this battle? You know, what's going on? And behind all of this is this question, is God good? You know, when you read people called the new atheists, or as Pastor Nathan calls them, the four horses of the apocalypse, you look at these atheists, very few of them actually try to argue against the existence of God philosophically. But you know what they'll do? They'll point out what they feel is how absurd religion is and how evil religion is. And years ago, about 10 years ago, somebody came up to me and said, Pastor Steve, I read this book by uh, Sam Harris and it really shook my faith. Would you be willing to read this book and help me understand if this is true or not, because it's really raising questions that are shaking my faith. So what does Sam Harris do? Sam Harris is making an argument, and his argument looks really strong. It looks like a brick. Like my notes here, there's a big, wide brick. And on his brick, he's not giving you philosophical reasons why God doesn't exist. He's telling you how evil God is, and he brings up passages like this. He'll add up the statistics and, and talk about the gruesomeness of it, and say basically, why would you believe in somebody who says that there's a God like this? But what you find out that his argument is really paper thin. And, but you have to have a little knowledge to come to that conclusion so that you can wrestle with those ideas. But as we pause for a moment to talk about this, here's what I want you to know and think about. There are some things in the Bible that we will not fully understand until we see Jesus in glory. We just won't. The Apostle Paul says in 1 Corinthians 13, now I see through a cloudy mirror, or the King James would say, a glass darkly, but then I will see face to face. So there are things in my Bible that your pastor does not understand. And this is one that's hard to understand. But let me tell you other pieces of the story that help us understand this a little bit better. If we went back to Genesis, I think it's around Genesis 15, God is showing Abraham the north, south, east, west, and says, all this land is going to be yours. And then he says, but not yet. Why? 
because the sin of the Amorites has not reached a level in which I'm going to judge them. Who are these people that they've just conquered? The Amorites. The Amorites is a catch-all phrase for the inhabitants of this land. In other words, God is going to be granting them over 400 more years of mercy, even though they are an evil people who sacrifice their children to the God of Molech, who practice sexual immorality by worshiping Asherah and having sex with prostitutes. They are an evil, corrupt people, and yet God is going to give them grace for another 400 years. But moving beyond that, we see in Abraham, this takes place in Genesis 19, God says to Abraham, I want to destroy Sodom, Sodom and Gomorrah. And, and God seems arbitrary to Abraham, and Abraham asks God, will not the God of all creation do what is right? That's a great question. God, are you good? And, and what does God respond? He says, test me on this. And Abraham does test them. What if there's 50 righteous people? What if there's 40 righteous people? What if there's 30? And in the end, God saves eight people who probably didn't even deserve to be saved. But you know, he saves them in his mercy because he's a good God. Then I realized that it says in Isaiah 55, my thoughts are not your thoughts. My ways are not your ways. As the heavens are above the earth, so my ways are above the ways of man. And then I look at the end of Job. You know what Job says? Lord, why is this bad stuff happening to me? And then Job says uh, to God, why are you doing this? And God says, Job, were you there when I created the heavens and the earth? Were you there when I breathed life into the horse, into Leviathan? And you know what Job discovers? I just do not have the, the concept, the mindset to understand what God is doing and how he does it. And he repents and covers his mouth. Here's what Jeremiah says. Does not the potter who makes the pot have the right to smash it down and make it again? And of course he does. The potter has that right. God has those rights to do that kind of thing. But at the end of the day, if you ask me, Steve, why do you trust God with things like this, even when you don't really understand what's going on? You know what it comes down to? Jesus John Piper says in his book, Seeing and Savoring Jesus, seeing Jesus is like seeing the sunrise and knowing it is light and not dark. It's like tasting honey and knowing it is sweet and not bitter. There is a self-authenticating value, truth to it. All I know is that God so loved us that he gave his only son to die that I might have eternal life even though I am not righteous, even though I am a sinner. And I take great joy in what Jesus has done. So when I see the stuff that I don't understand, I've seen enough in Jesus to say, Lord, for the stuff I don't understand, I trust you. Because I can see you loved so much that you gave your son for me. So as we look at this carnage, keep those things in mind. So let's wrap up. Chapter 11 is not as long. We read this. When Jabin, king of Hazor, this is chapter 11, verse 1. If you read it, it looks like Hazor. But when I was in Israel, the, uh, the archaeologist that was giving us the tour of Hazor called it Hazor, so I'm going to call it Hazor. When the king of Hazor heard what was happening in the south, he sent this word to Joab, king of Maiden, to the kings of Shimron and Ashkaf, and to the northern kings who were in the mountains in Arabah, south of Kinnereth, to the western foothills, and to uh, Naboth Dor on the west, to the Canaanites in the east and west, to the Amorites, the Hivites, the Perizzites, the Jebusites in the hill country, and to the Hivites below Hermon in the region of Mizpah. They came with all their troops, a large army of horses and chariots, a huge army as numerous as the sands on the seashore. All these kings joined forces and made camp together at the waters of Miram to fight against Israel. Whoa, let me show you the map of what this looks like. I'm gonna move forward through these pictures. Okay, here's the map. So here's northern Israel now. Everything we talked about before was taking place below this map. That body of water, that is the Sea of Galilee. 
And here is Miram, and that's where this great battle is going to take place. Mount Hermon is up here. Those are the headwaters of the Jordan River that flows down from Dan and past the uh, Sea of Galilee into the Dead Sea. And uh, that is where this is taking place. Verse 6, the Lord said to Joshua, Do not be afraid of them, because this time tomorrow I will hand them all to you, slaying over to Israel. This time tomorrow, an army as the sands of the seashore. Is this a hard thing for God? Well, the God who causes the sun to stand still, the moon to stand still, no, I would not think this is a hard thing for God. And I, I wish I could get this into my little noggin every time I'm so afraid. Steve, trust the Lord. Trust the Lord. He's big enough. He's strong enough. He's great enough. You will be fine. So what happens? He gives us one other instruction. Because this time tomorrow I'll hand all of them slain over to Israel. You are to hamstring their horses and burn the chariots. God is even telling them how you wrap up this battle. When they're all slaughtered before your eyes, uh, keep in mind, uh, when you're done, hamstring the horses and burn the chariots. So, verse 7, Joshua and his whole army came against them suddenly, sneak attack. At the hand of Israel, they defeated them, pursued them all the way to greater Sidon, Mizrapah and Maim, and the valley of Mizpah on the east until no survivors were left. And so on this map, you see they uh, fight right there, and then they have the Valley of Mizpah right here. They, they're, you know, they're chasing them down wherever they came from. And we read, Joshua did to them as the Lord had directed. He hamstrung the horses and burned the chariots. What I find funny about this battle, it's like reporting on D-Day. Oh, and by the way, the allies, allies won. Yeah, but there was a few things that happened in that battle. But the text doesn't say, but all we know is, hey, if you can hold on to the Lord, stop the sun and stop the moon, hey, he defeated this army as big as the sands of the seashore. Pause, quick question. Why hamstring the horses? Can't you use them for yourself? Why burn the chariots? Can't you use them for yourself? There's a principle in the Bible that shows up Genesis to Revelation. God wants you to be wise with your resources. He does. He wants you to save. He wants you to work hard. He wants you to be a disciplined person. We read this in the book of Proverbs. We read this in the pastoral epistles. We, we see this kind of instruction time and time again. But you know what we also find? Is that God wants you to become too rich to where you start depending on yourself and not on him. A principle to live by is if you get too comfy cozy with the money you have in the bank, the money you have in your investments, you need to look again. You know, I, I manage my mother's money and this past week has been very volatile. I watch her money go up $20,000. I watch her money go down $20,000. I'm like, how is it possible you lose $20,000 in one day? And, and you folks, some of you have significant resources. You've seen your money probably ebb and flow with $100,000 each day. But you know what? In the end, don't trust in money. Trust in the Lord. The reason why these horses had to be hamstrung and the chariots had to be burned is that they were not going to depend on these things. It's the Lord who stops the sun that you depend on. Not these petty little things like chariots and, and horses for your purposes. So let's wrap up here. At the time Joshua turned back and captured Hatzor and put its king to the sword, Hatzor had been the head of all these kingdoms. Now, I have a few pictures of Tel Hatzor. I've been there a few times. This is an overview, over a head view, beautiful sight. This is the uh, eight chambered gate. That is the city gates. And you can always tell the size of a city in the ancient world by how many chambers their gate has. This is the seat of government. Proverbs 31, a woman of great worth. Where is the husband going to praise his wife? At the city gates. That's in this area. 
So this is where the, the king or the judges would sit to bring justice to the people. But in times of war, this gate would be closed and this would be all packed with instruments of war to defend the city. So this would be viewed as a very good sized city. This is a close up of the city gates. Um, and uh, again, this is a very common ancient structure. You see this all through Israel. You'll see a two chamber gate, a three chamber gate, um, five chamber gate, uh, but all of it relates to the size of the city. This is just a little passing thing, which is in the area of Hatzor. And I just think it's so amazing. I, I had the chance to visit this just a year and a half ago. But this is the oldest arch in the world. Abraham could have walked through this arch. Now, all this earth around it wasn't there at the time, but that arch itself is the oldest arch. They built this canopy over it to preserve it because it is amazing. Think 8,000 years old um, to, to see something like this. Um, oldest arch in the world. Pretty, pretty amazing. Okay, moving on in our text. Joshua took the, these royal cities, their kings, and put them to the sword. He destroyed them. Now here comes a phrase which is going to show up again several times as we wrap up this chapter. As Moses, the servant of the Lord, had commanded. Yet Israel did not burn any of the cities on the built mounds except Hatzor, which Joshua burned. The Israelites carried off for themselves all the plunder and livestock of these cities. They got to keep stuff, stuff that wasn't going to be, um, you know, you might say shaking their faith in God. But all the people they put to the sword completely, destroyed them, not sparing anyone that breathed. Getting back to the issue we previously talked about. As the Lord commanded his servant Moses, so Moses commanded Joshua. And Joshua did it. There's that phrase again. He left nothing undone of all the Lord commanded Moses. So, the, so Joshua took the entire land, the hill country, all the Negev, the whole region of Goshen, the foothills, Arabah, the mountains of Israel with their foothills from Mount Halak, which rises towards Seir, to Baal, Gad, in the valley of Lebanon, below Mount Hermon. He captured all their kings, put them to death. Joshua waged war against all the kings for a long time, except for the Hivites living in Gibeon. Those are the ones who made a deal. Not one city made a treaty of peace with the Israelites who took them all in battle. For it was the Lord himself who hardened their hearts to wage war against Israel so that he might destroy them totally, exterminating them without mercy as the Lord had commanded Moses. At the time, Joshua went and destroyed the Anakites from the hill country, from Hebron to Debur to an Anab and all the hill country of Judah and from the hill country of Israel, Joshua totally destroyed them and their towns. No Anakites were left in Israelite territory. Only in Gaza, Gath, and Ashdod did any survive. So Joshua took the entire land, just as the Lord directed Moses, and he gave it as an inheritance to Israel according to their tribal divisions. Then the land was at rest from war. Now, something just happened in that last paragraph, which is so powerful. I don't want you to miss it, and here's where we close. Do you remember when Moses instructed the spies to check out the land? And they came back, and 10 of these spies said, it's dangerous there. We shouldn't go. But two people, Joshua and Caleb, said, let's take the land. Our God can do anything. Here is the passage. Verse, uh, ch Numbers chapter 13. But the men who had gone up with him said, We can't attack those people. They are stronger than we are. And they spread among the Israelites a bad report about the land they had explored. They said, The land we explored devours those living in it. All the people we saw are of great size. We saw the Nephilim there, the descendants of Anak, come from the Nephilim. We see my like grasshoppers in our own eyes, and we look the same to them. Going back to the paragraph we just read, we read, no Anakites were left in Israelite territory. That is Anak. We can't go. Anak is there. 
Joshua, by the way, I want you to know Anak has been defeated. I think that was probably a very powerful moment. The other spies, they didn't make it into the promised land. They were those who died in the wilderness. But Caleb and Joshua, they lived to see it. Our God is a powerful God. Now, getting back to your own life, do you trust God's promises? Do you believe him? Getting back to your own life, are you depending too much on your own money, not on the Lord? Principles in this passage to live by. Are there questions in this passage for you and I? There are. And there are some things we're going to ask our Lord when we get to glory. But till then, know that our Lord loves this human race so much that he gave his only son to die that we might encounter mercy. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the chance we've had to spend this time studying your word. Now bless us, grow us, make us into the men and women that you've called us to be. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. We will be meeting this Monday, the following Monday, Memorial Day. We will not be meeting. We're taking a pause on that day. God bless you. Have a great day.